This is the launch station, the only place you need to look for all things onboarding, implementation, and customer success. Tune in for insights from industry experts every week. Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Launch Station. If I had to pick one factor that often makes running client-facing projects stressful, it would be expectations around timelines, around capabilities or features, around how you engage documentation, could be anything really. So for today, we are going to discuss the journey of expectations management. And we have a special guest today, Peter Taylor. Some of you may know him on Twitter as the Lazy PM. He's a thought leader in the space of project management and has authored a number one best-selling book on project management titled The Lazy Project Manager. He plays the role of trainer, consultant, and coach in the world of PMO and project management. And if I haven't already set high expectations for our conversation today, Peter was also awarded the PMO Global Alliance PMO Influencer of the Year in 2020. Peter, welcome to the show. Oh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Yes, something good came out of 2020. <laughs> it was a great award. I was uh, much appreciative of it. Nice. So I wanted to start with a serious question, Peter. Word is that you're one of the most entertaining and inspiring speakers in project management. So on the entertainment front, how do you fare against Dilbert jokes on project management? <laughs> oh, I like Dilbert. Dilbert's good. There's a lot of there's a lot of good fun in project management. Um, yeah, I, this is based on something, and then that was a very nice quote that someone in uh, actually Australia um, said about me. I have no idea who. It's one of those um, you know, end of conference surveys that, that was, had no name. I, people accused me that it was my mother who said that, but it's not true. She, she'd never be that kind about me. But um, in my early days, I was, I was taught, or at least I was mentored, I think, by a number of really, really good presenters and trainers. And one thing that always stuck with me was uh, when you build, and I do a lot of keynote presentations. I mean, I've done over 400 keynote presentations around the world. But it was, you know, I was taught 80% entertainment and 20% information. And the reason of that is you engage people, you connect with people. And when you connect with people, they pay attention, they listen, they get inspired, and they can go and find out more information later. So I've, and I guess naturally in my heart, I also a bit of a, I like a bit of a laugh and a bit of a smile. So, you know, that, that's really where it all comes from. I guess the next natural question is, do you also do that in your planned presentations and kickoff meetings? Um, humor is a very, very um, sensitive thing. Um, I wrote a book called The Project Manager Who Smiled, which is all about humor, and I do training on, on presentational skills in that area. Um, it, it, you just got to be careful. You know, I have done it. I have done it, it with clients. But only clients I've had a great relationship with, I feel comfortable. So, you know, you, in anything in life, you don't, you don't meet someone and go for the big power joke or the, you know, the humorous introduction because you have no idea what their sense of humor is or what's appropriate or what culturally is, is appropriate. So, no, I don't do that typically. <laughs> I don't do that typically. Nice. Got it. Before we get down to the core topic, I'm sure the title of your best-selling book, The Lazy Project Manager, should have piqued the interest of our audience. Can you give a quick pitch on what it's all about and how project managers can benefit from it? Sure. I mean, it came about, it, I find it an interesting story. So I, I was firstly, it, it came about because I was insulted by my manager who called me lazy, the laziest person he's ever met. And I was very upset because we worked in three companies together at that point, And I thought he liked me, but actually he was talking about the way I work. And secondly, I was running a, a very large PMO um, and I, I was I was assessing how the how project managers were behaving. And if you like very, very simply, half were half were working no, fairly normal hours on average. We, we know projects go up and down. They're not, they're not flat. But on average, they were working 40, 50 hour weeks and they were being reasonably successful. And the other half of my project managers, and I had over 100 at that point in the PMO. Um, the other half were working what I thought were crazy hours, 60, 70, 80 hour weeks regularly. And interestingly, they were being no more successful. So I did some behavioral assessment of how, what they were doing and what was different between them. And the two things came together and it created the lazy project manager. And the lazy project manager, I think someone best described it as a way of managing yourself whilst you're managing projects. It's a way of, at the heart of it, I have this concept of productive laziness. I mean, I'm not just doing nothing, you know, that's not good, but working smarter, not harder. Uh, and, it, and it's built very much on my own early project management experiences of how I, I got so many things wrong. Uh, and people like the book because it's short. Um, it's full of uh, humor. Hopefully people like it. Um, and thirdly, it's got very honest, not case studies, little stories or where I really did get things 
completely wrong in my early career, but learned important things. And when it came out, there was nothing like that on the market. Every other project management book was, if we're honest, pretty dull, very long, very boring, detailed diagrams. Um, and it seemed to be from a world of perfection in projects and projects aren't like that. We all make mistakes. So that's that's a lazy project manager. And it's, you know, it came out in 2009 and it's still selling, which is which is amazing. Awesome. I think that's certainly a book I'm going to buy and check out. So I guess it feels like this whole aspect of executing effective project management while still doing less hours is sort of your superpower, being that lazy project manager at work. And being lazy doesn't really stop one from being smart, efficient, and effective is what you're saying. Yeah, and I think that's oh, a superpower. I don't know. Actually, one of the things I joke about in, in my lazy project manager keynote is, uh, you know, as project managers, we should have a uniform so people understand what we do with the, you know, with the cape and the capital P and the, the underpants. And if people saw us in a uniform, they go, oh, there's a project manager. Everything's going to be OK now. Um I, I try to teach a lot of project managers. I do, you know, I do coaching and training, et cetera, and speaking, of course. And it's, it's a lot of it is around trying to impart that kind of knowledge that as a project manager, you work in a certain way. And sometimes you are in the detail, but mostly you're not in the detail. Your job is to lead, to guide, to look ahead, to anticipate, to prepare, to support your project team. Um, um, and yes, you do a lot of work at the front end of a project to set things up and you do a lot of work at the end to wrap things up and learn. But in the middle, it's about the project team. And therefore, it's all about that kind of behavioral difference. And many project managers make that mistake. They get so in the detail that they, they miss the iceberg coming at them or something like that. And then, and that's kind of what it's all about. So I'm not sure it's a superpower. It's just, uh, <laughs> you know, I've been around for a while. So it's, it's kind of wisdom gained over a number of years and an awful lot of projects. That's a very interesting thought there, Peter. Uh, when we chatted in the past, you spoke about working on client-facing projects for most of your career. If you were to compare internal projects versus customer-facing projects, in what way are these different? There is a difference. I mean, projects are projects. Let's accept that. But actually, you know, client-facing projects, which is predominantly has been my career. So, you know, I, I, I've been fortunate enough to, to move up, if you like, through the project management uh, career path. I ended up helping to design and build my first PMO, um, you know, some nearly 16 years ago now. Um, I've, I've had the honor of, of building some of the largest PMOs in the world. Well, you're talking hundreds of project managers and thousands of projects around the world, working for companies, you know, like uh, Siemens and uh, also Kronos, companies like that. Um, and for the most part, you know, we always did internal projects, but most of what I did was overseeing through my project management community, client-facing projects. So these, these were typically technology companies deploying technology into clients. Um, there'd be a whole amount of work that would be done up front through the kind of perspective or sales cycle. Eventually the, the, you know, the, the, the prospect would become a client. Then there was obviously a project. They would like to get return on their uh, investment quite quickly. So suddenly there is a project or projects. And at that point, there's this kind of relationship has to be built between the supplier, which is effectively what I was represented as a PMO and my project managers were representing, and the client's business needs and the client's um, objectives with the technology. Um, and, the, and, and I think the big difference is, is that you're dealing very much with two separate worlds that have to come together, um, two worlds that have to kind of connect to work in some form of harmony. Now, Internal projects, I get it. You're, you're working internally. You're working with different departments, different teams, different people, different locations. So I'm not saying that doesn't exist and doesn't have challenges. But from my experience, I've found that client-facing projects have certain challenges that you kind of have to get up to speed. You have to connect. You have to learn to collaborate. You have to learn to trust with your clients. And when you don't get that right, then you have some problems. I think that was a good explanation on the differences, Peter. Thanks for that. So now moving on to expectations, what do we mean by expectations management? And I know you say it's a journey and not a one-off thing. So where does it start and where does it end? Yeah, so I came up with the, the you know, the, you know the, if you like the, the title or the, you know, the, the way of describing this is the journey of expectation management. And uh, if, 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 we go, if we go back to a sort of typical sales to sales handoff period of time, it does depend on the, your, your services or your products, or whatever your company is providing. But, you know, that sales cycle, that period of time where you are convincing a business to invest in your technology, in your people, in your product. It can be weeks. It could be months. 
I've known it be years as well in some cases. Some of the really, really big programs have taken that long. And the problem I found and my project managers you know, through my PMOs have found is that so many expectations were preset before even the project started. You know, if you just take a typical, let's say, six month sales cycle, how many conversations, how many meetings, how many emails, how many phone calls, how many discussions, how many documents are produced during that period of time that are constantly setting expectations for people, for the client stakeholders, the client resources, all the people we're going to have to work with. And then the problem I found in the past is that when you start the project, so much of those expectations are set solid and immediately you are, you, you are, you are struggling because as a, as a provider of this sort of technology, we need to learn more and more about the business of our clients. And our clients need to learn more and more about the solutions and technology and services we're providing. And if you start on day one saying, this is what the project's gonna look like, it will not change, you're, you're immediately into a problem. I like to use a lot of imagery. And if you can imagine the imagery in this situation is, uh, I use two. And the first one is, it's it's a handshake. You know, the contract has been signed. There's that lovely handshake. There's friendly. Every, you know, if you, anybody's ever been in this, they know it. it's a wonderful period. Everybody loves everybody else. This is going to be the greatest project ever. And how many times have I seen that handshake move swiftly into a more of an arm wrestle, a battle between the two, the supplier and the client. And if you if you put those two images in your mind, you can see how things go wrong so quickly. And it's it's all down to that kind of expectations that have been set. And so I came up with this concept of the journey of expectation management, which is that very early period in a project. So it's everything that happens almost, almost pre-project to a degree, all the way up to finalizing the output of the project. Um, it depends on your methodology, but you know, we used to have, you know, when I worked in Siemens, we used to have a, an alignment phase, for example, that would set up the project, then we'd move into a planning cycle that would produce all the formalized documentation. The journey of expectation management takes place during that whole period. And it means instead of locking everything down on day one, instead of rigidly documenting everything, you, you create a relationship that is of trust. Uh, of openness, of honesty, of communication that allows flexibility to provide the very best solution for your clients. And really, that's what it's all about. That makes a lot of sense, Peter. And I've seen clear differences between when organizations build that flexibility into their engagement and come with that mindset of, hey, we need something, but we're not super rigid about this versus, you know, those who come with that rigidity. And I'd also love to understand your take on who are the people who should take responsibility for setting the right expectations and who should be the lead actors on this journey? I think um, <clears throat> as a supply organization, we, you know, typically we have, you know, any supply organization will have greater experience of this process that you go through. You know, at the end of the day, typically, you know, it's a supplying company that delivers the methodology or delivers the framework or delivers the process, the tools, the templates that are going to be worked on in partnership with, with the client, typically anyway. Um, so I think it's very much beholden to the supplying organization to bring and start this conversation and start it really early um, to talk about, you know, the, if you like, the pros and cons. Um, if anybody's ever been through a fixed price contract experience, they, they know the cons, you know, how, they know how difficult it is to document everything and know everything on day one and how much time and effort that takes and how it's usually wrong anyway, quite quickly. So I think the drive for this, I would say, is the, the supply and servicing organizations. But there is, an, there is an argument that says that the clients need to have an open mind and you need to connect with the client sponsors, the client um, you know, steering board members, uh, the executives, the board members, the senior stakeholders, the project program managers, all of those people need to be drawn into this. And it's only then you kind of feel that you actually can have that agreement that there are gonna be problems, there are gonna be challenges, there's gonna be disagreements, there's possibly gonna be occasional arguments, but we're all progressing towards the same objective, which is, you know, the best possible return on investment for the client, the greatest business benefits of the client to support whatever is their, their business strategy. <clears throat> and a lot of this, I think, you know, comes down to setting the scene and, and the kickoff is a great, great place possibly to do that, you know, to, to start that, not even to start the conversation, but really drive that conversation through. Okay. So I'm going to latch on to that. You mentioned how the kickoff is a great place to start that conversation. 
So what are some tactics you would employ at the kickoff meeting to ensure that this is going in the right direction and to set expectations right and play this game the right way? Yeah, I think, well, so first of all, as I said, there's usually some there's discussions before the kickoff meeting. Already you should have you should have drawn in, you know, the senior stakeholders, the client into this conversation. The thing I've, I've seen and experienced in the past with kickoff meetings is if the kickoff meeting is very much a push situation, so it's, it's the suppliers, you know, presenting to the client, presenting to the client's project team, telling them what it's going to be like, and this is how we're going to do it and how great success it is. Did already, you're, I think you're going to experience some problems. It, this the kickoff meeting must be done in partnership. It must be done in equality. <clears throat> One of the most effective things I've, I've seen is where you do some pre some pre workshops and some pre sort of like almost you know supplier client project team building exercises between the two. The kickoff meeting effectively is the closure of all that process. So I've run it in the past. <clears throat> I have a thing called, you know, it's called the Project from Hell. It's a great exercise about our project failure. And you get to have a time machine. You go back and what changes you make. And it's all about, if you like, exposing the downside to not having a collaborative approach, not having the right foundations for project success, not having that journey of expectation put in place. So something like that, that allows the team to learn, to work with each other, to get to know each other is a very powerful thing. And then when it comes to, if you like, the formal part of the kickoff meeting, it really should be uh, predominantly uh, presented by the client, I believe, rather than, than the supplier. The supplier should have worked with the client and the client should be presenting the information, the output, et cetera. And I think those two things are really solid foundations for driving the journey of expectation management forward, that, that kind of period. And again, if I can throw in a second image, because I do like these sort of things. You know, the one I, I love to use, I have, a, I have this lovely picture of, of a, a, a path in a forest. And it depends which way you look at the picture. In, in, in this picture, there is a path and it diverges this way. So if you're walking this way and it diverges, then there's a problem because whoever takes the left path will not meet the people on the right path. What you need to do is to flip that picture around. It needs to be the two parties coming together. So it, means, it needs to be the supplier coming down one path, the client coming down path and joining each other on a common path moving forward. Again, things like that, you know, I've done it where we've had posters up on the walls in the, in the client sites, just image, you know, using those sort of imagery, reinforcing it on a regular basis, talking to people, communicating, all of that to build build that really great relationship to, uh, to bring about success. And I said, none of this necessarily gets rid of the fact there will be problems and arguments and discussions and really difficult meetings. That stuff happens, but that happens in our daily lives at a very small level. It's just a matter of fact, this won't turn into a war. It won't turn into an arm wrestle. It will turn into, let's solve this and let's move forward. Nice. I think the forest one was a nice imagery to have in the mind that, you know, you're going to come together on a common path. And hopefully that happens more often than not. So I think the other thing which I thought would be useful for people listening is to hear some stories of turnarounds and expectations, right? Do you have any from your time at Siemens or Kronos, et cetera? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I mean, this is part of the, uh, predominantly, you know, in both those organizations, this is part of what the PMO was all about. You know, we were, we had lots, you know, obviously all the project managers were overseeing the project delivery, but the PMO was brought in many times when there were escalations or problems, et cetera. And, you know, pretty much every single time we were able to turn it around. I mean, it, sometimes it took a lot of effort, et cetera. But at the end, it's, it's almost a repeat of what, I, what I've just said, is we had to get people back to basics. It, you know, we had to almost break the tension. And, and it's really where the PMO can play a great role because the PMO, whilst it is invested in what's going, it is also pretty much objective to what's going on in, in many ways. Um, and when there were these struggles, when there were difficulties, you know, bringing in a representative from the PMO, whether it be myself or any of my program managers, um, gave us the opportunity to sit down with the clients, sit down with our own team as well, and revisit the you know the, the tension points and and so you know why did this happen and, and what was the cause etc. And this kind of cause effect process usually allowed us to identify where the problems were. Um, and in most cases, it was it was relatively simple to step back and go, well, look, guys, you're not you're not on a path to journey expectation management. You, you know, you're on a path to to having that arm wrestle experience. You know, you're butting heads at this point in time. This is not good, is it? And and pretty much every client was accepted of that because they, they saw that this was not productive in any way. 
And by therefore resetting the scene, resetting the standards of how we're going to move forward, perhaps even having a, you know, a re-kickoff meeting we had in sometimes, uh, sometimes it requires some personal changes, absolutely. Uh, sometimes it involved you know, the PMO being you know, more actively involved for a period of time. But in, I would say, you know, in 90 percent plus cases, then we were able to to reset the expectations, reset the relationship and build that kind of collaborative uh, approach. I think the other thing is it kind of goes back not necessarily to recovery necessarily, but it goes back to how do you even prepare your future clients for this is your, your past clients. You know, any company has gone through this and has seen the benefits, whether that's a fully documented success story or case study or anything like that, or they're just willing to take a phone call or communicate, that in itself helps you overcome, I think, any um, resistance to this kind of approach. You know, this, there are so many stories of success, then it allows you to um, set the scene correctly for new, new uh, client-facing projects, or actually to reference back and go, the guys, this is why it's going wrong. You know, this is how, why we read to set, because these guys did it right, and they had this journey of expectation management, and look, they're very happy. Sometimes I've noticed that even when a project comes into the hands of the delivery team, the SOW has already been fleshed out in too much detail. What do you do in such a case? Yes, it's a it's a fine line. It's a fine line I found in organisations. There is this constant battle inside any any organisation that's a, a service oriented uh, company will know and recognise this. Internally, there's a battle. There's a battle between having a document that describes what is required in some detail, uh, which is if I, is either, either service led uh, focus, having a document that can be registered inside inside some sort of professional services automation tool or you know your oracle financials or any other tool that you're using that has a degree of simplicity to allow that do that is a battle having a document that your own legal department will be happy with is often a completely different document um and so the first battle takes place inside the supply and organization to find the the, the, the right set of, of you know the right level of detail Secondly, I think then is you, you've then got the relationship with the, with the prospect to, to, to clients, you know, as they move into it, they will have their own legal input, low demands, et cetera. It's, it's not easy. It's really not easy. Um, apart from the fact, I think part of that document, part of that statement of work um, really has to reflect on the process that you're going through. Uh, it has to almost document the journey of expectation management to say, well, this is where we're going to be, and this is where we're going to go, and this is the process we're going to go through, and this is the broad strategic intention of what we're trying to achieve, and these are perhaps some of the, you know, the, the kind of performance indicators and success indicators, etc. but not to document everything in detail. I mean, I personally feel if you document so much, you're just not doing enough. That's that's the problem. It, it's, I mean, it, it's, sort, it's sort of... Um, it sort of harkens back, if you like, a little bit to the Agile Manifesto, which you know, it, it's about people, it's about interactions versus process and tools. It's, it's not dissimilar to that. I'm not saying you have to run every project in an Agile way or anything like that. You know, most of my projects have been some sort of hybrid delivery. But the point about it is when you have that great relationship with your clients, then you have an opportunity to work at the people level and have those great interactions. And it's not about documenting everything. It's about documenting what you need to document as a minimum and constantly moving forward with the solution. And so, you know, it, I, I'm not dismissing this as a, 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 well, that's easy to do. It isn't. It's very difficult. There are so many different parties that come to play in this one. Uh, and there's a lot of tension as far as who wants what in, in what document. But I think it comes down at the end of the day to document the minimum you need to, document the way you're going to go about it, and then, then work at the yeah. level. I think that's a very good point that, you know, we document the way we're going to execute and maybe that's more important than putting down every little detail and the focus exactly. can be more on what the promised ROI was rather than the how that way, you know, we can work together to find that common path through the forests. So Peter, we're going to move on to the next section of our conversation, which is our rapid fire section. Here's the first one. What's something you would want to change if given a magic wand? Um, in the world of project management, I, you know, I'd love to, to move. It's kind of like everything we talked about. I'd like to move straight to a, uh, a world of trust and collaboration and honesty and communication. <laughs> There's a big magic wand there wanting lots of things. But I just think there's this... You, yeah, we know if, if, if there's a good degree of collaboration and trust between people, you can achieve so much more. So that's, that's where I'd buy my magic wand if I could in the world of project management. Perfect. 
yeah, we'd always want to establish that trust as quickly as possible. It solves so many, it takes so much tension and stress and waste of time out of life. Absolutely. What's the trend we'll see in the project management space in the next few years? Oh, I mean, I'm doing a lot of work in the area of project team performance management. That's one, but I think the one that really excites me right now, because I'm writing a book on it right now, uh, is uh, AI, artificial intelligence in the world of project management. I think it's incredibly exciting about what it's going to do. I mean, Gartner said, I think it was like 2030, 80% of what project manager does today will be done by AI. Wow. You know, does that mean the end of project management? No. Does that mean a better project manager? Yes. What does that actually mean? And I think that brings us right way back to people. I think it gives project managers time to, to work and focus on, on the people side of things. So AI, very, very exciting. So are you building something in this space or only writing about it? Uh, I'm working with a company that is building something in this space. And I'm also writing a book, which uh, will be out at the end of this year. Um, we're on a we're on incredibly uh, fast right on this one. We have uh, we're going to get the manuscript in by the end of uh, March, and it'll be published by the end of the year. So yeah, it's uh, just I mean again when I write about things, it's all fascinating because I start to research, I talk to people, I run surveys, stuff like that. I talk to project managers about how they feel about it, um, and it's you know it's just it, there's a real I think there's a real buzz about this one. That sounds really interesting. What's a book or movie that inspired you lately? I read a lot, so I'm constantly being inspired, and I watched an awful lot of films over the over the holiday period because there wasn't much else to do. Um, actually, the one I, the one I've just finished, I'll talk about that one. Um, <clears throat> it's um, I like to go walking, and this is a book, and it's called Walking Hadrian's Wall. Hadrian's Wall is a Roman built wall at the top end of England, between England and Scotland, pretty much. It runs for about 78 miles right the way across England, and it is incredible incredible archaeological site that is 78 miles long. Um, and it's a book all about that. And it's kind of inspired me that when, when we're allowed to go outside our houses here, when, uh, when we're allowed to travel, uh, that's something I'd love to do is to go and spend uh, a week uh, walking Hadrian's Wall because it's, it's, uh, it's just an amazing feat. I mean, you think it was done what, 100, about 100, 120 uh, AD, something like that. <laughs> uh, and there's this massive uh, construct in Great Britain. Well, that, that's super interesting. It's like, a, for me, it's like a project. A lot of the, everything I do is a, is a project right now. It's a, uh, and that for me would be like, that's, it is a holiday. It is a vacation, but it's a project. I like start to finish, learn everything, read everything, document it and walk it, experience it. It's, uh, you know, it's the way I work. Great. Best of luck with your vacation project. So now we are on to our last section of the show, which is questions from Twitter and from our Rocket Lane Slack community. Okay. The first question is similar to a question we had before. But where do you think tech will drive the role of a project manager? What will change? What will remain the same? Honestly, there's a whole bunch of things in project management which are really quite boring, and tedious. <laughs> and sometimes we're not very good at it as project managers because we are we have more interesting things to do. Um, so I think tech will drive us, AI will drive us in that, in that direction of actually taking over and probably doing a better job of the tedious repetitive stuff, of the kind of predictive analytics that take, you know, are really useful to a project manager, you know, allowing us to, you know, truly manage by exception, all that kind of thing. Um, but what it will do, it will put us back to, uh, put us back to kind of where I started. Because when I started out in project management, I wasn't actually called a project manager. I hadn't been trained on project management. It was actually eight years before I went on a training course to be learn to be a project manager. I think it was five years before I was officially called a project manager. So when I look back at that, I think, well, how on earth was I in any way successful? And, I, and I'll admit, I mean, those projects have, were relatively simple. They were small, single location, all resources available, et cetera. But the only way I can say is, well, I didn't understand the mechanics of project management, but I kind of had some sort of affinity towards people. I was able to work with people and communicate well. And, and I think what I've seen in, in over, over time is projects have become bigger and more challenging and more complex and, and global and virtual and all of that. And it's put a lot of pressure on project managers. Um, organizations are investing an awful lot more and expecting returns much faster, uh, which again has put more pressure on project managers. And, and it's not that they've forgotten people, they just don't have enough time. So I think tech in this case will free up a project manager for the ones that just embrace it, for the ones that accept the power of, of the positive that will come from the, uh, AI. I think it will free them up to be able to spend far more time to work with people with project teams to build that trust to collaboration and you know i think anybody who's in the world of project management knows that once you've got a really good high performing project team you know once they've gone through the tupman you know forming 
storming, norming, performing cycle, once they're, once they're at that high level, they can achieve anything. They can overcome any problem. Uh, they, they can be brilliant. And so I think that's what's going to happen. I think, you know, the great project managers of the future are going to really be able to build upon this. And I think it's, again, as I said, really, really exciting evolution in project management. You mentioned this before as well, that within your project team, you had some people who were more effective and some people who were less effective, even though they were spending more time. So what are the key elements that you feel made that difference between those who are high performing and those who are spending that extra time but not getting as much done? Yeah, I think two things. One was, I think, was uh, effectiveness of communication. The second one was um, uh, delegation through trust. It was, the, it was the big mistakes I made. You know, um, a lot of the lazy project managers built on a, a project that I ran for nearly three years, uh, multiple locations in the UK and in Europe, um, lots of problems, lots of challenges. And I, you know, at the end of it, I, I was pretty much burnt out. Um, and I had a real problem because I was thinking, I quite like this project management thing, but there's no way I can do that for another 20 or 30 years. It will kill me. So what am I doing wrong? And it allowed me to reflect uh on the things and the things i was doing wrong i was over communicating and the things i was doing wrong was i i was forcing myself to be at every meeting every discussion every call read every document uh there was nothing that could go on without me being involved i i didn't have that maturity to trust my project team to deliver for me <clears throat> and the result of that was i was burning so many hours crazy and I saw the same behavior in those project managers. Part, yeah, a big part of what they were doing was they were not releasing their project team members, not trusting their project team members. They were micromanaging. They were, they were heavily involved in everything that was going on. Um, and that's where they were burning all of those extra hours. Now, the result was, as I said, their projects were not dissimilarly successful to the other, other group of project managers. But... I challenged them and questioned them about well, why do you want to spend another 20, 30 hours every week when you don't need to? And so I think that that's at the heart of it. It was really that, as I said, the effectiveness of communication and the, the trust in your project team and, and truly delegating and getting involved when you need to get involved. Working smarter, not harder. Very interesting. I'm just curious. I mean, I would imagine that some amount of your thoughts around yourself as a project manager you're maybe feeling that, hey, my persona is all about being this diligent person, you know, being part of all the conversations, being on top of every single little detail. So how do we break from that mold? How do we convince ourselves that we're not being lazy, but you're actually being more effective? I think a lot of people would struggle with that. And I wonder how you sort of disseminate this at scale to people without them falling into that trap. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's part of what I, what I do. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's, a, it's part of a, you know, some of the speaking that I do and part of the kind of corporate training that I do. Um, it's a definitely a part of the coaching I do on the, on the kind of one-to-one -one level um, where people are trying to find ways to actually increase, you know, to restructure their bandwidth, not increase their bandwidth, but restructure the way they do things so they have aspirations, et cetera. And, you know, and, and people, you know, I, I get teased about the fact that, well, Peter, you're not lazy, you're, you're constantly on social media, you're constantly doing this, you do, you know, 50, 60 presentations a year or whatever. Well, that's true, because that's, that's what I want to do. You know, my, my behaving the way I do, it allows me to write a book or two every year, it allows me to do 50, 60 presentations, it allows me to do whatever uh, training courses I want to do, it allows me to work with, you know, organisations around the world. Now, I choose to fill my time that way. But if I, you know, if I was just doing, if I spent all of my time writing one book, you know, that would be for me not working smarter uh, at all. It'd be, you know, working the hardest way possible. Um, so I think two things there. I think you can get inspired by other people and you can be possibly mentored by other people. I mean, fine, if you're in a project management group right now and you feel that you are just working too hard and, and you, you struggle with that kind of effectiveness of what you're doing, have a look in your project, own project community. Have a look in your PMO. Who who are there? Do you could you admire? I go well, you know, why does this guy you know, go home on a regular basis uh, on time? Why does this lady have no problem with holidays and all the rest of it? And why are their clients happy and, and her clients happy? And talk to them, you know, just just open up to them and say, well, I, you know, I'd like some help. And I, I'm, I've typically found people are pretty open to doing that, of, of sharing their own experiences and their own wisdom. Got it. And I hope if there are project managers listening to the show who have fallen into that trap, 
they go and get help from someone else as you suggested so we have three more questions from the community here's the second one where does communication and culture fit into the pm role is it over or undervalued and how is the reality on the ground today well if we're talking about culture are we talking about the culture of the organization or are we talking about the culture of the individual i mean you know a project manager working in a in an organization and working in a client facing organization needs to understand the wonderful world of two cultures so we kind of go back to that you know if you come from um a very open let's do, you know i'm just using this very general statements here but let's say you come from an american based software orientated company you know you know, kind of, you know west coast you know pretty relaxed in the way you work and suddenly you're working with a quasi governmental body in the uk now there's two different cultures that are going to come together and and you know it's it's beholden to the project manager to understand that they cannot just go in and behave the way they would behave internally they have to respect the organization the client organization they have to respect the client's culture so one understanding culture and not adhering to it is probably too wrong a word too strong a word but respecting it i think is the first thing and then communication um it's a huge part if if you, you know whatever you read you'll you'll read that project managers spend 70 80 90% of their time communicating in some form or other so what a great place to become better and more effective in what you do and and this is an interesting one because it requires a lot of work up front and then then things are okay you know communication is about right information to the right person at the right time in the right way you've got to get all four of those right yeah if you give the right information to the right person in the right way but at the wrong time you fail to effectively communicate so you need to understand all of your stakeholders and how they want to be communicated to and everybody's different you know some people like a call some like a meeting some like a an email bullet point some people like a five box powerpoint presentation so you got to find the way to communicate individually because one of the biggest problems i see in communication is that people believe that reporting is communication and it's not i don't care you can produce the most wonderful 16 page report with every data point in it diagrams and graphs and fonts layouts and beautiful uh, images and you email it to every stakeholder and their best friend the chances of you actually communicating to anybody is pretty close to zero you won't because it's not right information at the right time to the right person in the right way and i see so many project managers making that mistake of not putting the effort in preparing good communication and what they get back is people not responding not understanding um expectations are misset so all of these things are intertwined i think in in being a, an effective project manager great communication is really really important and you know great communication goes back to the heart of what we just said it doesn't mean you have to be in every meeting it just it means that the communication flow has to be very clear and uh, and meet all of those criteria i talked about got it that makes a lot of sense peter uh, the next question is project managers focus too much on need documentation and plans and not enough on empathy and communication do you agree or disagree Oh, agree Move on. yes of course we agree yeah i agree i mean it's everything we talked about isn't it it's the fact that you know projects you know, if you got a project manager who sits in there you know in an office somewhere and produces the most wonderful multi-layered project plan that, that nobody can understand etc and doesn't engage doesn't talk to people then you've got a problem you know a project manager who you know who never leaves their desk and talks to people or you know, stuff like that you got a problem you know it at the heart of it you I'm not saying I'm not saying this this is kind of a world of anarchy at all no there is some degree of governance there's some degree of process there's some degree of control there's some degree of reporting obviously there's some degree of planning as well but at the heart of it is that back to that relationship back to that collaboration you know collaboration and culture and communication they beat plans uh, or anything like that uh, every single day every single day because the plans out of date isn't it that's the thing i i used to hate having to do really detailed plans when i was a project manager i far better sit in a meeting with the clients and talk about it and you know on whiteboard it and, and talk about the challenges and talk about the you know the key stages and things like that rather than producing this this vast um you know detailed project plan great that's pretty useful peter we're down to our last question of the podcast what does expectation management really mean on the ground you know beyond textbook definitions um uh, i think of expectation management and change management as an umbrella theme that has been neglected by pms and managers what's your take 
It's an interesting question. You talk about expectation management and change management. I mean, change management is part of the expectation management as far as I'm concerned. So expectation management is just this openness to the fact things will change and they will change for the better during this journey. And that journey could be a few weeks. It could be a few months. You know, it depends on the project. But for that period of time, there is this trust that each party, supplier, client, or even external uh, third-party organizations as well will be sometimes playing in this arena. Everybody will come to the table and will need to confirm, to clarify, to challenge, to communicate certain things. And all of it needs to be done in a very open mindset. Some of that may lead to some form of change, depends on how formalized your change management process is. Um, and some of it will... Um, not progress, some of it will progress, some of it will be agreed upon, some will be, we will be put in that good old parking lot for the future. But the point about it is each player coming to the table to talk about this would accept that the final decision by the collaborative, by the group, will be for the greater benefit of the client and the client's strategy and the client's business outcomes. Uh, and that, I think, is, is, is what it's all about, as far as I'm concerned. It's about working together working together in, in, in true harmony, true collaboration, true trust. So I'm going to add one more last question, Peter. What would your advice be to new project managers and implementation teams? Get to know each other. Get to, to engage with each other. Um, I love doing lots of exercises when I do training where you just learn things about people that you wouldn't find normally, you wouldn't come across, things that they, you know, in their private lives, you know, hobbies, activities, etc. I think I think a lot of, um that kind of relationship building is, is critical and i think it's something i have seen perhaps suffer a little bit in this current situation you know we go we go straight into our zoom meeting and we go you know it's stuff like that. we're kind of missing all of that background connection that kind of getting to know people um because we whilst you know, whilst you know all these zoom meetings and there are other products available of course um are brilliant for what they do I, what i've seen more and more is that people launch into the meeting have the meeting finished and they're off onto the next call perhaps even worse than you know the, in the days of having face-to-face -face physical meetings um but if you think about it um i was talking to someone recently about this and it's uh they've reinstated what they call the kind of casual social interaction activities so you know, they recognize that work carried on in the current situation but all that stuff that happens around the coffee machine around the water cooler over lunch down the pub um all the social interactions the accidental meetings all of that disappear completely and people were losing out as a result of that and i think in project teams and project managers particularly can, can make this happen is invest some time in that invest some time before you kick the meet the project off proper get some time working with your project team members getting to know them getting to feel valued building that trust building that that platform for collaboration to move forward it will pay pay dividends absolutely Peter, thanks for joining us on the show. You had some great answers and insights for us. It was great hosting you. It's my pleasure to be here. I've, uh, I've enjoyed the questions. Thank you.